Knicks fans of the round table, the round table debate show hosted for the fans by the fans. Today's episode, the midseason report, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Joining us today, my esteemed panel. First, Jay Ellis from the Nick of Time show, also post game live. We got Jonathan Macri from the Knicks Film School, and we got Alex Wolf from Posting and Toasting, Locked on Knicks, Newly Married. Uh, I don't know, Al, what other titles do you want, man? Uh, that's, that's about enough. All right. Yeah, that's enough good. About me. That, that's, that's good, man. That's good, man. All right, so anyway, um, we're at the midseason mark, just a little bit over. The squad is uh, 10 and 34 on, on the campaign. Been a rough season. Been a rough season so far. But, but, you know, there's, there's still have been some, some highlights to go with a lot of lowlights. And I, I think at, at this juncture of the season, I think the fans have switched on the Tankathon. They, 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 uh, they're, they're watching closely to see where we, where we end up. The trade deadline is vastly approaching. Um, so, you know, there, there's some things to, to look at in, in terms of where this, this squad is going to go forward with um in in the second half of the season including the unicorn watch and and when will kp come back so let, let's kick it off with some of the 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 highlights or the the good things that that you guys had uh seen so far this season al i'll start with you man what what are some of your good points um so far this season well i would say the number one good thing that i i sat and i thought about this for a minute and i was like eh, i don't know like what is what really is like the best thing in such a crappy season. I think the best thing is that the team is still bought in with only 10 wins through halfway over halfway through January. And there's been no reports of dissension, Yep. No reports of people being unhappy. Well, well, None outside of, of Canner, you know, you got the Canner situation that yeah, kind of sticks out a little bit. I guess, but I, he's, a, he's a cartoon let's character. Say, so anyone, <laughs> let's say anyone important. It yeah, has not been. There's been no dissent that way. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, props to him and his political activeness from this yeah. past week. Yeah, yeah, in all seriousness, hope, hope all the, goes yeah. well in that front for sure. Agreed. Yeah. But like, he's not going to be back past this year. So he doesn't matter to me. He may as well be on the margins at this point. But uh, just in general, like everybody seems bought in. Even Frank says all the right things still, which might just be that he's a professional, might be that he's legitimately cool with Fizz and, and how Fizz has been doing things. Who knows? Depends on uh, what reporter you read uh, to tell you how Frank's feeling, allegedly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's just kind of my – that's probably my number one positive. I like that they're still they're still going out there, seemingly still trying. You know what I mean? It, they, they don't have that defeated nature of other tanking teams that you've seen in the past, like – I know back in the day, you know, for whatever years ago, uh, the Sixers, I mean, they would go out there when they were like in the process and, and they looked like they were dead. You know, yeah. they they just they had no spunk to them. They, they looked like they were coming out expecting a loss. The Knicks, most nights at least, come out looking like they're at least trying to win the game. And then they just find creative ways to lose it uh, rather than coming out there, you know, getting blown out by – 30 right from the opening tip and just kind of mailing it in for the whole game. So that's kind of my number one. That's my number one takeaway. There's plenty of other good things too, I Mm -hmm. think. Um, But some of them we touched on, on the the mid season show quarter or the, sorry, the the quarter season, this season show, but uh, like Noah Vonley, his emergence, although it's becoming a little more um, concerning with him at this point, since uh, it's, it seems like it's going to be hard to re-sign him, given that the Knicks don't really have any upper hand to sign him. Um, but Cornette, Cornette's been a good revelation from the quarter to the midseason. Uh, him coming in there, starting some games, shooting lots of threes, and you know, generally looking like he could probably be an NBA rotation player. And then uh, Moutier, even though he's kind of fallen back to earth a little bit, he's been another one of my bright points as first bright half. Points. But that's Okay. Yeah, I won't get too into those in case that's someone else's bright point. But, All right. Yeah, my biggest <laughs> thing. My biggest thing is so I hear that. Um, Macri, before we get to your good point, um, touching on what Alex said, you know, watching this team kind of navigate 
through the difficult times, through the tough records, through the multiple permutations of lineups that Fizdale has thrown out there. It has to be more than the whole NBA combined in terms of the lineup changes. Um, what, what's, what's your take on how this team is, has been able to kind of persevere and still try to keep games competitive and, and still play hard for the yeah, most part, I- for the most part? Yeah, no, I, I, I actually, you know, that's that was going to be my um, top thing, too. And I'll, I'll pivot and go with something else. But just to Alex's point, um, I don't think you can overstate um, what it means to have a team that not only is terrible, but not and, and not only knows that it's terrible, but the guys know full well that um, the, a lot of them may be playing elsewhere next year as, you know, even the guys that are. That like if your name isn't um, Kevin Knox or Mitchell Ro- even Mitchell Robinson, like you you know that there's a chance that you may be playing for a different team next year, and for them and there's like there's a lot of different ways in the NBA to lose a game by 15 points. You could be like the Bulls or the Cavs on a regular basis, go down by 20 in the first early second quarter, you know maybe make it close late, or you could be like the Knicks, and game after game after game after game you're in it at halftime. A lot of games are even in it going into the fourth quarter. Some games are in it right down to the end. And then you end up, you know, you end up maybe losing by that amount anyway. I like say what you want about Fizz. Uh, I'm done trying to defend him in certain areas because I think it's silly to take anything away from this year in terms of like rotations, play calling, all that shit. Because what ingredients is he working with again? Um, And What's the purpose of this season? It's it's all evaluation. It's all experimentation. It's right. all supposed to be messy. And the one thing that I cared about going into this year as far as what I wanted to see is exactly what we're seeing. And so I, I think that's um, a huge, huge, huge plus. JL, so what's, your, what's your take on um, what, what you've seen as sort of a, a positive or a highlight thus far this season at the midway point? Um, I'm going to triple down on the culture. The culture theme that's happening. Um, shout out to uh, Mac Reeve. Listen to the Knicks Film School Rebecca Harlow episode. She that was a pretty good episode to listen to because it kind of illustrates. Thank you. The insider, insider Viewpoint. view of what's happening, mm-hmm. and it, it lets you know that that the culture is real. And even though we are not doing well, the guys are still upbeat. And you can tell by even reading the paper. Um, there was a few instances where Mario said that he was getting DMPs and, and regularly he would feel like he would be upset, but he's over here yeah. giving Fizz hugs. Shit, Mario's ready to sign right now. Yeah, he's ready to <laughs> sign. The way he's, he's ready. talking. He's ready. He's like, this is it. If I, he, he, He's proclaiming if he had the coaching staff in Orlando that he has right now, that he would be far better off in his career. Even Trey Burke, who's been DMP, DMP, says he wants to stay here. So that's an attribute to the culture that the Knicks are cultivating right now. So um, that's a huge plus. And you, you can't, I mean, I, I, you can't really talk about the positives without talking about the, the young core in general. We have guys here who were draft undrafted, drafted in the second round, who are considered possibly uh, first round talent right now. I mean, granted, Trier is kind of tapered off a little bit, but at least for the first half of the season before he got his big money, he, he was he's considered like a first half talent. So you, you just love the the culture, you love the development. You, you you see, what I loved about the season is everybody, damn near everybody, who had something to prove here, got better here. Yes, from Luke Cornette, good point. Good point. To Fonle, to Moutier, um. With the exception of Frank is teetering. You see small is you see small things with Frank, but I still feel like that's coming. But that's all country that's all culture based. That's all that means we're going in the right direction and you know that's going to help us moving forward when it comes to free agents. It might not pay off big this season, but we keep this momentum up. The word's gonna get around and people yeah. are eventually gonna go, go on, wanna come here. 
Yeah, well, no, you know, that that's definitely something that this organization has to shed in, in terms of uh, the negative perception of what the culture is and, and uh, you know, management certainly has a lot to do with it. But, you know, I agree with all you guys' sentiments, especially the development of some of the youngsters, the undrafted talents, Luke Cornett. We saw some, you know, sprinkles of highlights from Dots in between last year and this year as well. Um, uh, Vonley having a resurgence, Moutier having a resurgence here and there. So you certainly have to give credit to the, to the coaching staff and Craig Robinson's secret sauce maybe uh, – <laughs> <laughs> maybe it was in, yeah. it spilling into the tea, man. Maybe that's what he was alluding to. Um, all right, so so let's let's touch on the bad. Al, I'll go to you. I guess it, you know, there's a lot of things you can look at as a ten and thirty three team. Although you know, like Macri said, you have to understand the roster that we're dealing with. So taking that into consideration, where would you go for your bad in, in return in in terms of this team at the midway point? Yeah, I mean, take your pick, right? It's kind of <laughs> there's <laughs> there's quite a few things you could say are uh, bad uh, on a team that's only got ten wins. But my, uh, you know, we were just praising Fizdale and praising that he's managed to pull the best out of some players and and definitely seems to have uh, gotten the most out of these guys that were pretty kind of cast off. My biggest thing would be Fizdale's weird definitions of what earns playing time. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, that kind of – he kind of says one thing and does another sometimes, and it's a little bothersome to me. Um, he's uh, – the biggest one is Frank. And, I mean, Frank is such a such a polarizing point of contention kind of player this year among fans that um, I feel like he comes up all the time for someone who's averaging whatever he's averaging, like five six, points a game six or points whatever. A game like right now, a, yeah. Yeah, six points a game for a player like that, you wouldn't think he would be like the focal point of so much of what the fan base is talking. He really is. And, and it's just because, you know, he'll give Frank DNPs or he'll give Frank the short leash on not being too aggressive, uh, which is certainly a problem of Frank's. But it seems like where he gives other guys, you know, some play out there, like Trier with his shot selection was just terrible. And, and only up until the, the last couple of games, was Trier actually uh, like Trier wasn't really punished for that? I should say, you know, he was he was still getting thirty minutes a game or whatever when he got back from his injury, and he was shooting like one of fourteen, and you know, taking just horrible, horrible shots. Yeah, um, and only in the last couple of games has he sort of scaled Trier back a little bit to try to get him set. But you can say the same thing for Moutier. There's been certain games where Moutier just isn't really playing well, and he doesn't get the the leash like that. Trey Burke, like when Fizz decides that he wants to play Trey Burke, he plays Trey Burke, you know, like <laughs> he's out there for 25 he's out there. no matter what. Yeah. You know, he could be, he could be shooting terrible, not doing anything to help the team. And Fizz doesn't seem to care, but then you put a guy like Frank out there or Dotson for that matter. Dotson has gotten another kind of weirdly short leash. Um, you know, if they start to struggle a little, little bit on offense, it's like an instant yank for them, which is so strange because those are probably the two, the only two guys in the backcourt that you could truly say that like will give you something if they're not wearing the ball on defense, you know, especially, especially Frank. And and then I would say, I guess to man, maybe even not to a lesser degree, Dotson. Dotson has been a very good perimeter defender this year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's, on ball. that's kind yeah. of, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> back cuts like. So I mean, it's just it, it's a little weird to me. Wish that Fizz would kind of um, hold everybody to the same standards. It seems like he certainly values guys that are confident in themselves on the offensive end and willing to just put up shots, which is fine and a good trait to have. But he kind of, I think, overlooks the the other side of the ball a lot of the time, yeah. and and. And even overlooks when guys are missing shots as long as they're taking them. You know, it's, it's like he just wants to see guys taking shots, and that's his biggest, like, I don't, I don't know, criteria for success, I guess. So uh, that's my that's my bad point at risk of okay. rambling too much further. Oh, yeah. good. Uh, JL, to Alex's point, you know, on, on our show, we hear a lot of fans uh, complaining about the – inconsistency on how he holds players accountable. One oh, of the yeah. guys that Alex didn't mention, which is the number one guy that... Oh, feels, you know I was coming to it. That, you know that, that is is never really <laughs> seems to be in Fizz's rotation doghouse. That's Tim Hardaway Jr., man. Yeah. So um, yeah. Talk, talk about that a little bit on, on Alex's point of lack of accountability or inconsistency in accountability. Yeah, that's exactly where I was going. <laughs> because 
like Tim Hardaway Jr. has not been consistent since that Portland game. He hasn't been consistent on the defensive end at all this season. And I was kind of giving Fizz a little slack there because he seems to be playing some little Jedi mind trick. I don't know if he's playing with the, the players and the media, but he does this thing where he's where he's um where he says, you know, I'm trying to teach the guys defense and I want to put them in situations and show them I trust them. So then like the last game when you have like a Moody A Knox, Tim Hardaway Jr. Your old your old Matador D yeah. team out there trying to get a stop. <laughs> yeah, trying to get a stop with the, when we're up one. You start to think like, is he is he is he doing this so they can get the reps in on the defense and grow as a team, or is it just bad coaching? So you like you don't. I never I never know where to go with it mentally. But Tim Hardaway Jr. in particular, he just seems like he's never penalized for his defense or his offense. He hasn't been shooting well. Since the Portland game, I mean, granted, we've seen statistically better with him on the floor, even when he's missing, which is crazy. But I just think that accountability has to happen from top to bottom. And I saw him do it with Mark and Saul, so I just, I just knew he was going to be mm-hmm. able to do it with Tim Hardaway Jr. But for some, for whatever reason, it didn't happen. And his his minutes have tapered a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but maybe that's know, more I so feel, because of the injury rather than than maybe you know, yeah. For a fall into the person, at least the injury just the injury alone just tells me that he should just sit. In my opinion, he should just be sitting. He should and and play the guys who are playing defense or who are playing both sides of the ball, or at least learning to play both sides of the ball. Because you preach defense in the beginning of the season, and then you don't reward you don't reward defenders except for that one little stint for like five games when you played the the kids, the all defensive lineup with Mitch and and Dotson and and Frank and like. Play them. Play the defensive guys. And sit Tim Hardaway, please. Yeah, it would be nice to see some consistency on that. Like, is that your – you concur with Alex's point, or do you have another bad to tack on top of that? I mean, it's not really – because you expect a lot of the bad anyway. So it's not really – like, it's that. And I know there's a, the Frank Milikina thing. Like, I'm still on the – I'm still part of the Frank Hive too. But I still – Personally, I just wanted him to see – I wanted to see another step defend, definitively taken in that direction. Like, okay, he's he, he's gotten over the confidence issue. He's gotten over, you know, uh, the shooting issue. It seemed like it was training that way in the beginning of the season and it's kind of tapered down a little bit. I really – I'm really rooting for this guy. I really want to see him take that next step. Yeah. And, um, I mean, so far he's been kind of a disappointment to me this season. I'm hoping he turns that around. There's still time. He feels like he's being a little bit more aggressive. His three point percentages has jumped since December, but I still want to see another something more from my personal. Macri, on on the um, what what's your take on on Fizz's inconsistencies in in holding players accountable? Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah. I'm I'm in the minority on this one because my. My thinking, I'm, I'm always trying to at least try to get into his head in terms of what he's thinking. And my, my thought process is, all right, I have to, I have to, I have a year to really strengthen weaknesses in all of these players. Right. And, and figure out if that can be done. So every player on this, on this roster, um, <laughs> without exception, maybe except for Vonle, <laughs> has a, some kind of glaring, glaring, glaring weakness in their game. And I have been more lenient with him giving more time to Moutier and Tim and even Cantor for a while um, because it's like defense is one of those things that it's – it. I feel like it, it, it takes time to – develop habits um maybe i'm wrong about that maybe i'm i'm completely over overreaching with that opinion but it's like all right i if he if his stance was i want to know by the end of this year whether tim hardaway jr emmanuel moutier in his cancer whoever else you want to say whether they can be passable on defense well how do you do that you put them out there and you see you know whether or not they could do it so I don't view it as like a penalty i would view it as a penalty of for frank and, and to a lesser extent that if they weren't playing or if they weren't playing sufficient enough minutes in, in my mind, I, 
I, and then it gets into some of the accountability issues, which is like, all right, we're, listen, we all want to see Frank play 25 minutes a game, but how do you keep a straight face to the rest of the guys in your locker room to play a guy, literally he's the worst shooter in the league of anybody with a, a usage rate uh, above 16, and that's playing 20 minutes a game. It's 173 guys in the league with that, with that, that are above that right line. Frank is the worst shooter out of all of them. <laughs> when you go by if, if, if uh, and I'm a huge Frank fan. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So if you want to like, we just talked a few minutes ago about buy-in about culture, about accountability, about all that wonderful, good shit. Well, guess what? Sorry. I, I shouldn't curse on you. That's no, right. Um, well, your, um, your, your French has been pardoned on the Frank top. <laughs> if, yeah. if you want to get to that point, some of it's going to be ugly and some of it is going to result in things that maybe you don't want to see. And one of those things is like, all right, we have to, we have to hold you to a certain modicum of accountability. And guess what? The guy who's the worst shooter in the league is still being sent out there every night, with the exception of the four DNP CDs. He, he's gotten playing time the whole year. He's averaging about twenty minutes a game. So, um, you know, I don't have as much of an issue with that stuff. And it, and again, it it bears repeating. They have like they have to make a decision on Moutier this summer. Mm -hmm. Right. Because and, and I, I hate to put this out there, but I, I have to. Frank Milikin is on the books for five million dollars each of the next two years. If at the end of this year. You can be in a position where you could get an asset or even at the trade deadline, get an asset for Frank. What do you think Moody is going to cost you the next two seasons? About five million dollars a year, given how he's playing. So if you if your purpose of this year is for evaluation and experimentation, and again, I don't think this, but I think it's within their right to to do what they need to do to make that decision, because it's like, all right, if we're gonna if we're gonna pay a point guard about ten million dollars over the next two seasons, let's figure out who it should be. I don't have an issue with how they with how they've handled things so far. That's me. Yeah, I mean, I, I think to your point, I, I think you can't just, you know, a lot of fans want to just say, well, you know, Frank is our future. Why are they why are they prioritize Moutier? But I don't think it's it's a it's that cut and dry uh, of a situation because you still have to see um, what the long term prospects may be with a with a guy like Moutier. And he has been for the most part the the, the best point guard on the team in in terms of um, you know getting guys involved penetrating uh, pushing the pace as Fizz wants to do being aggressive as Fizz wants to, wants his point guards to be you know it, it's not as cut and dry uh, on the other topic to me on on the accountability thing um, you know I, I looked at I looked at that London game against the Wizards and I did say at that that closing stretch where were our you know, defenders there when we needed a spot, a, a stop, fresh off of the timeout. And I, I do understand, you know, it could be a teaching moment, leaving leaving those guys out there who are more um, defensively deficient to see if they would, you know, could get a stop or if they could make the proper adjustments to, to make a play. And, you know, maybe it's it's something that Fizz wants to do in, in, in terms of trying to increase their defensive acumen. But also on the flip side, I, I said this on Twitter, it's like I want to be also confident that Fizz is going to put us in the in the right positions to win a game, you know, by making the proper adjustments yeah. in, in those situations. Because I mean, let's 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 be real. We don't have that much um, of a resume to look at from Fizz to to really be confident that that he is a a good coach. You know, we're we're going off of a lot of yes yes is Memphis year in a year and a half. Um, that full year was good. The, the second year, obviously, things fizzled. And mo for the most part, we're going off of a, an assistant coach's resume. So that's the only reason why I say, you know, I want to I see him, even though, yes, this is a throwaway year, and, and yes, we don't have the talent. I still kind of want to see him, see how he handles those situations um, in, in those critical situations. It's just, I don't know, you just... I sometimes I just don't know if he's like Jedi mind tricking everybody. You know what I mean? Like I don't know because <laughs> I don't know because sometimes you got the glasses on, you seem like he's like a chess player and he's thinking like five moves ahead. And sometimes I'm be really I really be wondering sometimes like yo is he planning for like the future future? I don't see it because beginning of the season he had Frank playing the wing, and then later on he's like oh this this is my grand scheme to get him comfortable 
um, just taking over the offense and not just having to worry about where other guys are. And then he paint, then he moves him to the point guard position. So you start to think, well, okay, is was this like the is this like a grand scheme plan overall? I, I don't think he knew. I think he was legitimately. <laughs> I, I think the organization just does not know, man. I don't. Yeah. I don't think they really know. Yeah. Like. I don't. I don't know, man. I don't. I go back and I really go back and forth. Like, is he really just still testing? Can I, Can I jump in on that? Just yeah, go ahead, go ahead, yeah. It, it, isn't it nice though to, for once, have a situation where it is a thousand percent clear that the organization has given the coach. They've told him, "Look, you do what you got to do. We, you are not getting judged. Not that you're not getting judged on anything on anything you do, but like." we trust you to develop this group of guys yeah. and we are not like, we're not going to tell you on day one that we're not going to judge you on wins and losses. And, and then midway through the season, start judging you on wins, wins and losses. Right. It, it's like, I think they made this hire with the full knowledge that we trust that this guy knows how to coach. And like, I like, J-, J. Ellis, I get your point about look. We don't have, we don't even have two seasons worth of of Fisdale as a head coach, but he was an assistant coach in this league for under some of under you know in arguably like the best one of tree, the, the three or four coaching trees yeah. that actually matter. Yes. under Celestra, under Riley, if there was ever a guy to give the benefit of the doubt to, yeah. like look, when it comes to winning games, he'll know what to do. Right. It, I think it's it's. Uh, hey, I mean that's that's our DNA, right? It, that that's our DNA. As exactly, much as, as yeah. much as I hate Pat the Rat, you know, uh, the yeah, the yeah. DNA from that coaching tree, um, you know, it, it goes on it goes on. Said Al, what you you have anything to chime in, or, or you switch to the Yog Week topic, man? What do you think? I think you guys did a pretty good job with it. I mean, I guess my my last sentiment on that whole thing is that i don't i to to jl's point about whether it's jedi mind tricks and all that i don't think it's that deep with fizdale i think legitimately he's just he's trying stuff out yeah he uh he has a team that's not very good and they're losing games as a result like i i think some people like to put on the tinfoil hats and i'm not even saying jl's necessarily but i see people on twitter and stuff like being like oh this was like master tanking move like as of the other day you know? like, <laughs> yeah like, right right nine, right, right. You know, they're up 19 and then it's yeah. like oh fisdale fisdale knows what he's doing yeah he's trying to lose this game the three bad yeah. defenders in the last <laughs> on the last game he's yeah. like a but very like, masterful tanking move like he's it is but <laughs> he said all season that he's trying to win games and they're not tanking and yeah. and I'm inclined to believe him like i don't think that's lip service i think he's legitimately he thought that they could probably be better than they are. Yeah. And some in the organization might have thought that they could have been better than they are. And the reality is they're just not very good. So that's kind of how it is. Yeah. Just you know, on, not- on that, just because I, I thought about the same thing. And like, I think there's a subtle difference. It's like he wanted Tim Hardaway Jr. to not get lost on that switch at the end of the Washington game. And he wanted that to happen so they could win the game. Because he wants Tim Hardaway Jr. to be a better defender than he has shown. Right. But mm-hmm. at the same time, he is not going to put, like, could he have put in a, a Courtney Lee? And would have Courtney Lee have made the correct decision on the switch? Yes. So it's like, is that tanking? Is it actively true? I, I don't know what that is, but it's in that weird gray. That blue area. Line. Yeah. I mean, not even just Courtney Lee. He could have put in Dotson. He, he could have put in you in or me. Yeah. Or <laughs> I'm actually kind of a horrible switch defender. So I get caught on a switch. I'm cooked. So don't don't put yeah. me in there. But maybe you. I, I can't speak for you. I'm 5'7". <laughs> I'm not bothering anybody. Yeah, man. My, my, my half-court defense at LA Fitness is, is, is not up to par for face, man. <laughs> <laughs> not not up to par, man. All right, um, I'm so a, I'm a big on the playground, you know, so I I can't do these switches. Yeah, very slow footed. Oh, I'm like Luke Cornett. Don't oh, don't put man. me on a switch. Just just just, <laughs> ma- just man the paint. Just hold down the oh, paint. Man. Now that's it, man. Whatever the bambi legs. Oh, man. That that's it, man. <laughs> All right, Al. What, what's what's your uh, what, what's been the toughest thing to watch? The the ugly part of this midway point so far for this team. What, what's it been for you? Uh, all right, so you caught you caught a big omission in my back. And it was Tim Hardaway. And the reason I omitted him is because I was leaving him for the ugly. Part. Oh, okay. Um, okay. All so right. Little Jedi yeah, mind tricks from Alan going on here. There's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to go. Okay. There's nowhere to go from here. I got it. <laughs> yeah. But so it's not to say that it's not to say that Tim 
has it, that his play is necessarily been ugly 100 percent of the time the thing that's ugly to me is that they're still letting him play through what now appears to be multiple injuries in the lost season when you're invested in him for multiple years after this already uh, like it, it just it doesn't make any sense to me that's the ugly part to me i can understand them playing your vets because you know you want to keep some semblance of like uh, older players on this team that can like lead the guys out there and whatever fine all all well and good that's okay but like you have some young guys that are that are vets at this point you know someone like Vonley, he's been in the league now this is his fifth season um you have a number at moody it's his fourth year you know guys like that they they know their way around the league you don't need to play tim hardaway just for like that quote unquote veteran presence or you have another guy sitting on the bench in Courtney Lee who can give you a, a somewhat of a semblance of what Tim Hardaway gives you and you know won't be hurt and like clearly a detriment to the team while he's out there and risk hurting himself further and Courtney Lee would be nice to pump up his trade value too if we're being completely honest yeah. like Which maybe seems you know, like that should be I've been saying that for like a month <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. you that? me and everybody except for Fisdale apparently but I mean, the, the Hardaway is he's got he's got plantar fasciitis. All right, that's like a painful injury that can only be. It's like a I, I don't know precisely what it is. It's something in your foot, and it, the only way to heal it is rest. There's no other way to heal it. You can't you can treat it, you know, and, and uh, dampen the pain a little bit, but you can't heal it while playing on it. So it's kind of like a sprained ankle or something, but like less uh, less like outwardly painful mm -hmm. all the time. But uh, the great last time. so, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so you, you got to rest him uh, for that first off. But then you've seen in the last couple of weeks. I mean, he had that he had that instance where he bangs with Vonley, and it looked like he tore his ACL for a moment there. Oh like, yeah, where he was laying on the ground, and he's probably got a bruise on his knee or something from that. He had the hamstring. He was probably compensating for his foot or something, and like almost pulled his hamstring. I, why not just sit him down at this point? Yeah. I don't. I don't understand the point of keeping him out there. And he's clearly affected by these injuries, too. That's the worst part. It's not like, to his credit, you know, and his cancer, say whatever you want about him on the court, but he played injured for a good part of last year. But he didn't really look all that diminished. You could see him maybe, you know, limping a little bit when he was getting up and down the court. But when he actually, when it got time to play, he was, he sucked it up. It was, you know, he did everything that he would normally do. Uh, Tim is not doing the things that he was doing early in the season that benefited him so much. Cause I don't think he has any lift anymore because of all these injuries. He's not getting to the rim. He's yeah. yeah. That's, that's one thing that slowed down. He's definitely yeah. not penetrating yeah. as much. He's not getting to the rim at all. And he doesn't have any burst. So he doesn't have the burst to get to the rim. And then he's also, it seems like his, he's not even getting as much lift on his jumper because he's leaving a lot of things short and just in general is not, not putting the ball where it needs to go, aka in the hoop, obviously. Um, so it, it just to me, I don't know. I it seems very, very silly to still have him out there, and I, I really wish that they would, uh, you know, just sit him, rest him for a little bit. I mean, seriously, tanking teams have rested guys for far less than the like, you know, laundry list of injuries that Tim Hardaway has right now. I don't think it's a stretch to say that like you could sit him and the league would not bat an eye at it. You know, as far as like investigating you know intentional tanking and all that he's beat up like sit him out that's it it's so that's my ugly i i don't yeah i don't want him out there anymore i i i would quite frankly be fine with them shutting down for the season at this point to get him right because you already know what you got in him right if you're gonna trade him teams already know what they could get out of him so and, and teams would presumably want him to be healthy if they were going to trade for him and he's clearly not right now anybody with two eyeballs can see that he's not healthy yeah. So, yeah, just sit him down. Sit Tim down. That's my ugly point. You know, just don't don't keep playing this hurt veteran out there, and and at the detriment of developing guys that need development. You know, it's it's yeah, not pretty, not good. True indeed. Hey, I I can't argue with that. Uh, Macri, what I'll give you a chance to touch on the Timmy topic if you want, or just go straight to your ugly point of view. Yeah, no, I mean I'll touch on on Timmy briefly. I I just um. I wish I knew, because my my ugly point is 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 the defense. And as much like so, I before I praised Fizdale for putting guys out there to evaluate them to see um, whether or not they'd be able to become good defenders. The the other 
side of that coin is the fact that by and large they have failed in that um, evaluation process as we are, I guess, currently whatever the 29th ranked defense in the league. The, the, the way this relates to Timmy specifically is I think given, given what we've seen from Tim in the past, I think you could make the argument that he has been the defender that has most underperformed this year. And I say that with in full cognizance of the fact that Ines Cantor exists. But the reason I phrase it that way is because Ines Cantor has played the same defense he's played his whole career this year. We've seen Tim be a better defender. And to Alex's point, I just wish I knew how much of that was due to the injury. Because when I see him just die on screens, just absolutely die on screen after screen after screen, um, give like 65% effort to get out on a shooter that's open and he, it's his man. I don't like, I, I don't know. What is that? Is that he's, is he conserving energy because he is trying to play through the injury on the other end of the court mm. and his team needs him to do that. Is he just, you know, not giving as much of a shit as he should. I just wish I knew that. And I'm not going to comment on it cause I don't know, but it's, I, I'd be lying if I said I was not thinking about it, but yeah, I, I expected more from like Moutier as a defender mm, this year mm. and, and Timmy and like some of the other guys. And the fact that like, if you, cause I don't know, some people say defense is 90% effort. Some people say it's 50% effort. Some, some people, you know, different percentages, but I'd be lying if I said, I thought we would be this bad um, defensively this year. It's, it's been, it's been rough. The only reason that I have some hope is because over the last um, – I tweeted this out the other day. Over the last seven games, um, they have been the 21st-ranked defense in the league by defensive rating. I think we're going to see it get better over the second half of the year. Um, so, yeah, it's been ugly, but I'm hopeful that it will not be my ugly for our um, end of season. End of season. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, on, on the defensive topic, you know, Fisdale was asked about it, uh, I believe, a couple weeks ago, I think when they were on the West Coast tilt, and his response was that, um, you know, the team has been struggling with the concepts. They're a young team, inexperienced team. You know, yeah. you, you have all these teams coming in here and, and giving them varying looks on the offensive end, and it's kind of confusing these guys a bit. And and so he he assumes or, or he believes that as we see these teams a second time around and, and get for deeper into the season, uh, the defense should pick up. So we'll see. We'll see. I, I, I agree with, uh, on the uh, – uh, I'm kind of – Shock, not shocked, but you know, I, I I thought that the defense would have been a, a little bit improved, especially with particular players uh, upon Fizdale's arrival. But uh, let's see what happens. Jay Ellis, um, what's your take on on um, the defense, Timmy, or what's your worst or what's your ugly for for this midseason point? I mean, geez, I already talked about Timmy to, to nausea, so I'm, yeah. I'm gonna lay off. <laughs> I'm gonna lay off the guy. I will mm-hmm. say, I do to add to to Macri's point. I, I kind of feel like Tim Hardaway, he fought over a lot more screens on the Jeff Horn sack, which is weird. So I, I really do think that – um, And in Atlanta, by the way. Yeah, mm. Atlanta the end of his tenure in Atlanta, he did. So I really think that plantar fasciitis thing is, is is a lot to do with what's going on. It has a lot to do with what's going on with Timmy right now. And um, But, yeah, uh, the defense definitely has been pretty bad. I was kind of hopeful in the beginning of the season. And – I didn't want to get the fool's goal because the first game of the season, we played the Hawks, we kind of smacked them down, and the defense looked, you know, pretty damn good. But, of course, you know, we have we're playing a young team, don't really know what they're doing. And um, it seems like the steals are up. It seems like the percentages – but we weren't able to sustain that. And some of that could be – I still don't know. I'm still giving Fizz some, some leeway here because you have to understand that the defense is going to go up if there's more defenders – one on the squad or and two in the in the lineup you know but you know that's neither here or there the defense is to get better and i feel like the the ball movement as well the ball movement hasn't really been that consistent and and i'll say this too even guys like burke and frank i felt like their assist numbers were a lot better last year. like i don't know what happened this season but when burke was starting he was averaging like around seven assists a game, and all of a sudden, this season couldn't pass the ball. And the same for Frank. I feel like I don't know if it's the the roll men aren't aren't um the timing on the roll men hasn't been as good. 
or what, but the assist from Frank and Trey Burke this season to me hasn't been as good in, in, in a whole. And the team, really, bottom of the league in assists hasn't really been good as a whole as well. So. You know, I actually have, uh, as far as the Trey Burke, Frank thing, I have sort of a, a theory as far as that goes. So first off, the Knicks don't really have a single good screener on the team. Mm, and that's, that's true, so too. That kind of destroys pick and roll. You know, Cantor slips his screen before the guy hits him almost every single time because he starts diving towards the hoop. Uh, same thing. I mean, Cornette sets okay screens, but he's not useful as a pick and roll man. He's, he's only not a really, roll man. He's yeah. a pop. Yeah, yeah he, he's pick and pop, like, strictly. And then Mitch, same thing. I think it's out of, out of concern for his, you know, young – underdeveloped body that yeah. he's not he's not the run of those hits yet um and then vonley vonley does actually set good screens but they don't seem to run a lot of pick and roll actions for right. him which is strange you know more often than not they'll have him out around the perimeter right so i think that has something to do with like i, I feel like it's too soon to judge frank mm-hmm. the point guard until we see him with porzingis yeah, because that was the guy that he had the most success with last year was porzingis you know his numbers with porzingis were insane um, and yeah. he had so many assists to Porzingis, both as a role man and as a pop man. Mm. Um, and, and I feel like it would open the floor better for for a guy like Frank. Even for Trey Burke, I mean, Trey Burke didn't get to play with Porzingis, but the thing with Burke, and it's the same thing kind of with Trier, if their shots aren't falling and Burke's shot has not been falling like at all, uh, if his shot's not falling, he's going to look to get a shot going first yeah. and then look to get his assists going after that. You know, he's got like a like a flow chart. You know, right. he's got to he's got to get the shot going. And then if the shot gets going, then everything look else can start work. But, oh, yeah. but first, he's he's looking to shoot. And I think also to a degree, and I kind of touched on it before, uh, Fisdale encourages shooting a lot, you know, at least for these for the guards. You know, he wants to see his guard shooting. And I think that sort of taps into Trey Burke's worst instincts, which is mm-hmm. just kind of start chucking. Um, and, and I think I don't think that's been very valuable. That's been that's been one player that I think has been really adversely affected by Fisdale this year, because mm-hmm. I think he's been focusing on all the wrong things with Trey Burke. You know, Trey Burke should not be looking strictly to be like a primary scorer. He has it in him to go off every once in a while, but yeah. he's not. He, but he's but not I feel like, like I feel like that's kind of his game, though. You know what I'm saying? Now I feel like when Trey stopped worrying about facilitating first, that's when he started having his good games. Like that Boston game sticks out to me. You know, um, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, but that's a game when he was hot, though. You know what right. I mean? It's it 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 comes and it goes with him. Yeah, but yeah. you need some sort of baseline to contribute if your shot isn't falling. That goes a lot more than it right comes now. too. You yeah. know how too? Yeah. K- Ko, what about? I mean, Ko set pretty good screens like for us last. He did. Year. Yeah, Kyle O'Quinn. That's that's right. They and you know he's a guy that's gone now, but he he set some some and screens. You know he went up there. He would take whatever contact. He didn't care. Yeah, yeah that's a valid point. That that would attribute to some of the assists. That opens up a lot of things when you have a good screener on the top of the offense. But yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, man. So real quick, let, let's let's touch on the we have the trade deadline coming up couple of weeks or a couple of weeks out from the trade deadline the rumor mill is, is swirling the the hot stove is I don't know how hot it is or or if it's just um you know typical you know fodder for, for this time of season but it's some it's some intriguing moves or transactions that that could be out there if we wanted to make it one of them is um Noah Vonley I'll, I'll open it up to you guys um what do you guys you know Philly had been rumored to be interested they've shot that down through uh, various outlets, but just the whole prospect of potentially trying to deal Vonley for an asset. Um, what do you guys think about that? Macri, I'll, I'll go to you first. What's what's your take on it? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, it's we have to be careful because you can't go like uh, definitive. You have to trade him definitive. You can't trade him mm-hmm. because everything is in context. Like, no, I'm not going to give up Vonley for um the second round pick of one of the better teams in the league. Yeah. Because that's nothing like it, Yeah, exactly. Because it's like, even though they have essentially no contractual or no advantage to resigning him, whether they trade him or not, just like holding on to him sends a little bit more of a message. Like we really want you here. And if that gives them, you know, maybe a shot to, I don't know, sign him to the room exception in the off season. 
Um, is that worth giving up for, again, the 50th pick in the draft? No, not mm-hmm. to me. Mm-hmm. That being said, because of the contract stuff and because of the cap situation, um, to turn down any deal that may even remotely make you a cognizable better team, whether cognizably better team, whether that's attaching him to Lee, whether that's getting um, even a second round pick a few years out that could for a, an organization that's a happy organization that it might be a good pick. Um, and God forbid if they could get a first, uh, I, I don't, I don't think you could blink. I think yeah. you you have to deal. Yeah. Well, Philly Philly holding that Chicago second rounder, which is you know an, an early second, could could be uh, intriguing. J. Ellis, what do you think about it about the Von Lee trade prospects? Um, it's funny because if you asked anybody in the beginning of the season whether you wanted Von Lee to be here, and you projected. Like, oh, this is going to be one of the favorite guys on the team. I'm going for everybody. But like, yeah, when up. when we signed Von Lee, when man, that first here. that first live stream that we had when we signed Von Lee, the fans were killing this deal. This guy stinks. He's terrible. He has no IQ. And now he's the hottest thing smoking on this team, man. You can't Best make it up. Best player on the team. Best player on the team, man. Can't make it up. Yeah, like I, I really, I mean. Maybe I'm a fan, but I really would like to keep Von Lee here. I'm considering. I don't know. Maybe maybe it was the defense on Giannis. It's like, man, I don't know anybody else who can really keep up with a guy like that. And wondering when KP comes back and, like, he can be a nice little anchor for us going forward. Like, I, I really want him to stay. I understand contractually, though, it's going to be difficult with him raising the stock. But uh, it's like – I would trade him if the right deal came along. I definitely wouldn't do like a second for him. And there's like an isn't like another dimension to this too because like I know everybody is focused on free agency, right? Like the big the big thing is we're gonna clear cap space. We're gonna bid a big name free agent here. Kevin Durant's gonna leave Golden State to come here and I'm not so sold on that. I think that's what it really is. Like, in my gut, I'm not so sold that with the Clippers over here with two two max contracts ready to go, mm. uh, Brooklyn, no one wants to talk about Brooklyn, but yeah. Brooklyn is over here with the, the slot as well, and, and they're performing well. I don't know if we're in line in the depth chart of free agents who wants to come here. And ask, yeah, I, I know we're going in the right direction, but I'm not completely sold that we can get a big free agent next season. Though, but isn't is isn't that more of a reason to look for every opportunity you can to get a legitimate asset? Yeah, I, I feel I feel like if we can if if it was if it was a way we can I know we can clear two if I know we can clear a uh, cap space to get to get two agents here, two free agents here, two match free agents here, then yes, I would do it. If it's if we clear cap space and we only have one then room for one, not counting KP, then I'm not sure it's worth it because I don't think one's going to come here by himself. Al, where yeah, are you at on this? I just say the other low key uh, uh, potential other max destination is Philly if they decide to to you know let Butler go. Yeah, oh, that's if, right. If they renounce Butler, then they can sign another max guy that's there right. too because they have almost no money. Books. Yeah. Because uh, Embiid and Simmons, and Embiid and Simmons aren't uh, aren't up for for their uh, heavy well, bags. Well, Embiid has it already. Simmons is on his extension now, okay. so he's he's getting paid twenty some odd million, you know, twenty eight whatever. But yeah, yeah Simmons, Fultz, uh, who everybody forgets about, those two are making like a little less than ten million a piece, and then mm-hmm. other than that, it's like scraps, you know, mm-hmm. or expiring contracts. So, um, but and not to talk too much about our stupid division rivals. Yeah, stupid okay, who cares about them? <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh as far as Vonley goes i and i give i give macri and jb at nick's film school lots of credit for this they've been super on top of this um with the cap permutations and all that uh Vonley is only making minimum this year he was only signed for a one-year deal so the knicks can only give him uh if they retain him through the rest of the year they can only give him 120 percent of what his minimum deal was worth so two million dollars something like that and he is like 99% certain as a as a 23 I don't know if he'll be 24 by the time free agency hits but as a very young free agent showing the type of talent that he's been showing this year he's yep. for sure going to get paid more than 2 million dollars a year 
So that's basically useless. Those rights, you know, that throw it out the window. Most of the time when you're, when you're trading somebody, you're trading their rights with them as well. And that's the important part, you know, it's like, Oh, this guy's an expiring contract, but you get a leg up to resign him, the new team. In this case, no such, no such thing. You know, the team that trades for him has the exact same shot of signing him as the Knicks do. And the Knicks still have the same chance of signing him when he comes free agent in the summer as the team that they traded him to, or if they just held on to him. So that that's the biggest thing to me. I don't necessarily want to trade him for like, you know, some crap package either, like a uh, uh, second round pick protected through pick 55 yeah. or something, you know, yeah. like those deals where teams essentially trade someone for nothing. Yeah. Cause that's, I wouldn't do that. that sends a bad message to Von Lang. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and if you want to potentially bring him back, then you don't want to send a bad message to him. Yeah. But if the deal comes along, say Philly's involved and they want to – my dream deal with Philly would be somehow you trade them Vonley and Courtney Lee, who, who's still owed you know $12 million next year, mm-hmm. which Philly, as I just mentioned, they don't have much salary on the books, so they yeah, can actually accommodate them, take, that take and take still them. sign a max player. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you do that, and then you take back Wilson Chandler – on yep. an expiring and um, whoever cork Maz, whatever, some other $1.5 million player that they have sitting on the end, you know, the end of the roster there, mm-hmm. uh, take someone like that along with Wilson Chandler, get off at money. And even if you don't get another asset, that's fully worth it because now you just got rid of the Lee money. Now you fully, you know, opened up your max spot for this summer and you're in real shape like salaries. Can, now. Go yeah, ahead. no, sorry, Alex. I, mm-hmm. I just want to jump in with something after you're done. Uh, okay. Well, just real quick, my last thing would just be when Von Lee's on his way out. Look, the the one thing that I think we know at this point about this new front office is that they're pretty player friendly, yep. and they seem to have a way with talking to these guys and and enticing them to be Knicks at, at this stage. You know, because they brought on all these. They had Hazonia who picked the Knicks over other suitors over the summer. Von Lee, same deal. Um, Moutier seems to have really, you know, embraced the organization and wants to play well for us, all that good stuff, which that's probably more fizz, but uh, besides the point on his way out, my thing would be, I would say to Von Lee, look, like you understand this is a business. We want to pay you, but by keeping you versus getting rid of you, we can't pay you any more or less than, you know, if we keep you. So we're going to ship you out. We're going to get, you know, we're clearing up some more salary space, which we can use to pay you in the summer. And if they got a, a pick or something out of it too, if they got a second round pick, be yeah. like, we got a pick, we're getting more talent. The whole goal is to get better, but we really, really want you back. So please keep us in mind this summer. You know, don't forget that we're the team that gave you a shot, you know, and, and that we really want you back here. But this is a business and we need to make a business decision. That would just be how I'd frame it to him. And, you know, ultimately he would probably also appreciate the opportunity to play for a playoff team and to have sure. a chance, you know, to potentially right. make the finals or something. So, I think I think it would be a good idea to trade him. I, I really think it would suck, like from our perspective, because I've enjoyed watching him, and yep. he's probably the most night in night watchable player that this team has. Yes, but you know, it, it's it's a smart business decision to get rid of him, and I would probably do so, especially if there was an opportunity to either get off of salary or get a first to early second round pick. That that would be my stance on it. Macri, go ahead and on your top. Yeah, the really quick thing mm-hmm. is uh, two things. I would even throw in one of the Hornets' second rounders to make that deal happen, that Philly deal that Alex mentioned. I don't think Philly cares about getting any more second rounders because they have a billion as it is. Mm-hmm. That's one thing. Second thing, and this actually goes against the point that, that I'm making, and uh, I wish I knew the Twitter user that pointed this out, but it's a great point. The one advantage the Knicks do have by keeping him through the year and then even if they sign him to a one-year deal for next season is then by the end of next season, you have his early bird rights, which does that actually does matter. Um, and if they really, really, really believe in Fonley as like a long-term potential core piece, like we want to, you know, build around this guy as, as one of our, like, you know, our first big off the bench type of deal, um, then – Again, something to factor into the consideration, but just to back up whatever what has already been said, that does not mean that you you lick a gift horse on the mouth here. If you get something good, you, you deal. 
Yeah, I, I concur on all points, man. Um, the the last trade, the last trade uh, rumor that that I want to harp on because I I don't really see the the salary dump trades, whether it's Courtney Lee, whether it's Timmy, or even you know Canada to a lesser extent. I I don't really see them being realistic. Um, we just heard earlier this week that the uh, the Canada Sacramento deal never really had much legs, and that that's pretty much falling off the table. So. This, this, uh, we, we saw Bondi, uh, we talked about it earlier, Bondi came out with a piece on Frank and, and potentially the Hawks being interested, um, but a, a lot of people in the Twitter sphere or on, on the Knicks social media, the Knicks digital atmosphere, um, want to see Frank traded for and bring in Dennis Smith Jr., man. What, what do you guys think about, about just the overall prospects of trading Frank and this whole Dennis Smith Jr.? fascination where Knicks fans want to right the wrongs of last year's draft. Uh, Jay Ellis, go ahead, man. Wait, weigh in on this, man. Oh, man. You're like a whole episode on this. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. I know everybody <laughs> likes shiny things. You know, I know people like dunks. Dunks are cool. You know? But I just don't see it, man. I don't. I, I, I don't like... Like, we, we don't need a me first guy to be the lead guard. This guy projects, his talent projects for him to be a lead guard. He doesn't really seem to have that I'm going to set up my teammates thing that Franks has and that, that I want in the point guard in general. The defense is still not good. I, I've seen Frank blow by him when we played Dallas and that should tell you something. So I mean, <laughs> <laughs> the, like the deep, like I don't, I am not, a fan of Dennis Smith Jr. I'm not saying he's a, he's not a talented kid because he is a talented kid, but I just don't see him being good for our team. I I want a facilitator as a point guard who plays defense, and I so I, that's that's my first priority. Like to be honest with you, I'm looking at I'm looking at this, I'm looking at these college, I'm looking at John Morant, and I'm just like, see, he dunks, but he sets people up. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. like that. That's that's what I'm, I'm looking for. Someone's going to set somebody up, especially you got you got KP over here, and you got Knox projecting to be a, a stud popper. You need got some guys to set the table sometimes. So yeah. I'm not I'm not no I'm not doing it. Macri, what do you think? <laughs> um, I don't want any part of Dennis Smith Jr. The the one thing I'll say on Frank, and I <laughs> this is coming from someone who literally just wrote uh, almost two thousand words about. I, I don't yeah. think they should trade him. No player in the NBA, with the exception of you know, between three and five names is untradeable, um, nor nor should they be. Um, you take every deal at face value. Um, we were talking about it a little bit before we came on. My thought is that they would move Frank if it meant, A, getting off of Tim's salary, and B, getting back some kind of a um, young slash draft asset in the deal. Um, just how... Uh, nominal of an asset that would have to be like we we all remember I think it was two years ago um, Philly traded Nerlens Noel for and they touted in the press release that came out uh, Nerlens Noel traded for a Dallas first round pick well no it was a protected first round pick that anybody with a brain realized was never going to convey so I I don't want them to to trade to do that type of deal just so they could trot out a press release saying, here, look at this thing that we got. Right. Because that would be bullshit. That being said, if there's a deal out there where you get an honest to goodness, like real, like legitimate asset back, either again, either a young player or a draft asset. I, I mean, again, and you're not going to find a bigger Frank fan than me. And I think it would be bad process to a certain extent, regardless of what they got back to trade a 20 year old point guard that you drafted with a full knowledge that it was going to be three, four years before you, you saw this thing out. Um, I think you have to look at it. I think you have to consider it. Um, nothing should be off the table um, for this team at this point it, with, with the, you know, maybe with the exception of Kevin Knox, because uh, I, I can't imagine that you'd get anywhere close to the value of what we, it looks like he's, he's going to bring back long-term. Indeed. Al, your, your takes. Yeah, so specific to the uh, Dennis Smith and Frank thing, straight up, there's no shot. I, I would never do that trade. Yeah. Not straight up, because 
it, on top of everything else, you know, on top of his deficiencies on the court, it seems like Smith has something going on in between his ears. Exactly. That's, you know, he's fixing. Yep. Uh, whereas Frank, you know, through everything, through all of his struggles and everything, has been just a consummate professional the whole time. Uh, as far as if there is a deal that I would maybe make with the Mavericks that involves Smith for Frank, there is one, and I would only make it in a specific circumstance. So if they could do a deal, and again, this brings like Tim Hardaway into th- things. If they could trade Tim Hardaway, his remaining long-term money, plus Frank for Dennis Smith Jr. So you do and that West Matthews. And Wes Matthews' expiring contract, I might do that. Only if I knew through back channels as the Knicks that you have two free agents that would be willing to sign here, you know, like two max free agents, because yeah. then you wouldn't get Hardaway gone. And that's the way to do it. And I mean, as much as it would suck to give up on Frank, if it opens the door for something along the lines of like, I hate to even speculate because it just it, it feels like dirty to think about, you know, the, uh, so much good happening for the Knicks at once, but get down in the mud, Alex. Come on. But man. if it was, <laughs> if, if it was like you know Kyrie and Durant or something, let's say we're like, oh yeah, let's team up on the Knicks. Like this seems like a sweet you know situation with yeah. Porzingis, presumably. Let's let's say Zion. That would be dope. But you know, even if it's like whoever else, you know, uh, Culver, whatever, they get another top lottery talent. They get those guys there. Plus, they already have Knox. They don't have to give up Knox in this instance. They have Mitchell Robinson still. They don't have to give up Mitch. I mean, that's like a really good young core. Plus, you just add two all-stars. I mean, that's a freaking no-brainer. Like, yeah. Frank could turn into a star for the rest of his career, and that's a good trade. You know what uh, I mean? Like, that's, that's the only way I do it. I, I'm not, Alex, I'm not, would, you, would, you rather have, would you rather have Dennis Smith Jr. or the Mavericks 2021 top – 10 protected 2021 top 10 protected that's where you going <laughs> 2021 top 10 protected uh uh I, i'd probably take i'm going 2020 i don't want to mean it's rough but i might <laughs> yeah. actually take smith. honestly i might take smith just because um you figure by that point Doncic by 2021, like awesome. with how good Doncic is, yeah, yeah they're, they're going to be a playoff over. team by then. So yeah, it's like take a top ten pick, you know, a guy who's just top ten pick a year ago, who definitely has some talent, just clearly is not putting it all together. Uh, versus, uh, you know, whatever twentieth pick or whatever in a few years, twenty fifth, twenty eighth. I think I'd probably yeah. go. With that. Yeah, exactly. So I, I would probably go with Smith, just because then again, Smith is still a relatively attractive piece if you can kind of get his head on straight that might be the guy you use to attach to courtney lee to move him to fully free up two max spots something like that uh probably just a smidge more valuable to have like a tangible like young player that's playing well but if you don't flip him then yeah yeah you just don't want to see him in his i don't i mean mean, i'll admit like (laughs) pre-draft Pre-draft, like before that seventeen draft, I was I I liked uh, I liked Smith a lot. Yeah, I like I actually wanted I, I wanted the Knicks to take Smith that year, but I didn't realize quite how, how much of like a like a malcontent he was. Yeah, you know that he's he seems very needy. You know, in the sense yeah. that he needs the ball in his hands and needs you know. We all have needs. Out. <laughs> well, you want to need the octopus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that's my point. That's my point, man. And and for 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 all the knocks on Phil, for all the knocks on Phil, the senile tendencies, the dementia-like tendencies. When he tested the kid with the Come octopus, on. he wanted to see if he was gonna take Damn. one for the team, man. It was all about sacrifice, man. Phil was always cerebral. He wanted to see if the kid was willing to do what it takes. And the kid passed. And here it is now. The Mavericks are putting this kid on the trading block. It's a buyer's remorse, man. I would I would stay far away from this kid. You know, some people want to yeah. say it's because him and Luke are gelling. I mean, they're only midway through the season, and they're ready to bail on this kid. I, I don't like the signs of that, man. I don't, I don't like the signs of it. Yeah. I don't think it has anything to do with them not. I mean, they're both. They don't gel. The, I feel like it just it don't make sense on the court together. You know what I'm saying? It's, just, it's, it's obvious. A guy who can't really shoot threes and can't play defense can't be next to another guy who doesn't play defense, and he actually sets up his teammates. Like you have to separate them. So Keep it, in mind, it makes it's, sense. <laughs> it's Smith's camp that I think is is angry. Trying to get him out. Yeah, mm. it makes sense. Yeah, it just makes sense. 
I'm, I'm not. I'm like I'm not even as much as I don't want him here. I don't think any of this is even his fault, really. It's just that's not the type of player he is to, to, to be yeah. matched with Luca. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think some of it's his fault. Yeah, <laughs> it's definitely not. He's not like like. I mean, for, depending on what report you read, it sounds like the Mavericks are like, you could come back whenever you want. And he's just like, nah, just straight. <laughs> nah, just straight. Well, yeah, 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 that, yeah, that part, yes. I'm talking about the, 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 the circumstances of how the pieces fit in Dallas. Is yeah. Really, oh, yeah. Not, yeah, that's not his. Attitude. Story. Yeah, that's, that's a different story. Absolutely, man. All right, so with, with that being said, the, the round tables is near its conclusion. We'll just give you guys your, your 30 second spiel to promote your sites, give the fans something to, to look forward to in these in this last half of games. Um, Jay Ellis, I'll start with you. Yeah, uh, just Nick and Time Show. That's that's where I'm at. We're on SoundCloud, or iTunes, newly on Spotify. A, eh? uh, I think we're on Google Play right now, and you can also check us out on YouTube. And I think you're going to have the great Sweeney on the next episode. Sweeney's on next. All right. All right. I, I hope you have your uh, your profanity sensors on and, and, and ready to go. <laughs> uh, we've, we've, already, we've already contacted the FCC. All clear. <laughs> we can go ham. <laughs> and, and we still do sell merch. So if you need uh, Nick's uh, hat, I don't even have my hat on today. I'm bugging. Hats, t-shirts, hoodies, still called the Nick Time Show.com slash catalog. And yeah, follow me on YouTube and all platforms, Instagram, Twitter, all that. All right, all right. JLs appreciate you once again. All right, Macri. Now. Um, Nick's Film School Podcast. Uh, if you haven't checked it out already, we have a couple more uh, pretty significant guests coming up between now and the end of the year. Um, some to strict strictly talk basketball. Some that are, um, it will be some basketball, but some other stuff that I'm excited about. And yeah, just, you know, my message always to Knicks fans, don't, don't give up hope there. I have a feeling there's going to be some nice trends between now and the end of the season that um, will make you feel a little bit better about your life as a Knicks fan. So keep the faith. That ounce of optimism from Macri, man. All right, Al. 30 All right, seconds. Let me, let me just- Stretch, Stretch it out. out. I got more. We'll be knowing you ready, now. ready to go. All right. To promote. 30 <laughs> seconds. Oh, yeah. You got All a right. laundry list, man. Go ahead. So so check me out uh, online on Twitter at the Alex Wolf. That's Wolf with an E. Uh, check me out on Posting and Toasting where I write and I tweet for them. So that's at PT Nix blog or postingandtoasting.com. And then also check out Locked on Nix podcast. I'm now a co-host of that. Uh, we're on all the major podcast platforms. Uh, make sure to give us five stars and all that good stuff too. And uh, yeah, that's it. All right, I guess I didn't take that one. I'm pretty. Oh, no, you, us at Lock on Knicks on Twitter. You yeah. were you were right on time, man. Thirty <laughs> seconds, man. So uh, once again, want to uh, thank my columnists Jay Ellis, Jonathan Macri, Alex Wolf. Appreciate you guys for coming through once again. That has thank been you. the Knicks midseason report the good the bad the ugly shout out to everybody who's watching the premiere live on youtube you can catch the replay of this show around the clock on twitter on facebook as well as well as in podcast form on spotify google play itunes and stitcher so uh we'll see you guys next time for the end of the season wrap up peace i've been calling calling this in the entire time i want to self-proclaim myself the president of the trade, Timmy Jr. <laughs> fan club over here. No, listen, um, listen, listen. Great, go ahead, Jails. Go ahead, Jails. There's a lot of people gunning for that title, dog. You're not. <laughs> there's, there's like six, seven, eighty. Carlito. Right. 